Okay, hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar for the UNCG Library's Research and Application Webinar Series. My name is Sam Harlow and I am the UNCG Online Learning Librarian. I'm also the Public Health Education, Kinesiology and Community and Therapeutic Rec Librarian as well. In this series, different librarians cover topics on UNCG Library's resources and research tools. They're 30 minutes and they're recorded. And then we do put them on YouTube where we will close capture them and not have participant data available uh, for the public. So I'm gonna put the um, webinar webpage in the chat. And uh, so you have it and that's, we'll, we'll email you the recording and it will also live there in the YouTube one. Um, so I'm gonna cover some logistical things about how this webinar is going to run. Please mute your audio during the presentation by clicking the audio icon next to your name to turn it red. That doesn't mute us, it just mutes you. Um, but feel free to turn your audio back on at the end of the webinar to participate in a conversation with the presenter. If you do not have a microphone, you are also welcome to participate in the chat. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please put them in the chat and I will track the questions while the presenter uh, goes through the materials. If there are any technical issues, you can email me. I'm going to put my email in the chat and we'll try to work through some solutions. But worst case scenario, please remember that this is recorded. So before I introduce myself, does anyone have any questions either in the chat or you can turn your mic on? Okay, so today's session is on researcher identity management, as you can see um, from the title research identity, managing and raising the visibility of your scholarship, and is by Anna Kraft, our UNCG University Libraries librarian, who is our coordinator of metadata services. So Anna, uh, you can take it away. Thank you, Sam. Um, thanks for facilitating the webinar, and thanks to everybody for being here. I am excited to talk about research identity and how this can hopefully help y'all. So, a few questions first about why this might be relevant for y'all. So if you're thinking about how you can make your research stand out and how you can make sure people find your research while also making sure that your research is attributed to you and not someone who has a similar name or similar research interests or areas, then research identity management, <clears throat> excuse me, is something that may be able to help you. So we're going to talk about what research identity is and why managing it is important. We'll talk about some freely available and widely used researcher identity management systems. And hopefully there will be enough information for you to select some, one or more, that are appropriate for you and your research. And so these terms are thrown around a little bit interchangeably, research identity, researcher identity. We're really talking about the same thing. And this is kind of like social media, but for your research. <clears throat> Not fully, but there are some similarities. So what is your research identity? It encompasses all these things on the slide. Your institutional and organizational affiliation. So your affiliation with UNCG, if you are a grad student or a faculty member. Um, citations of your research and publications. The way your name appears on your publications. So my name is Anna Craft, but I often publish under Anna R. Craft or A. R. Craft. Um, so the way that different systems see that and associate my work with me as a researcher um, is part of this. Your peer review and editorial activities, your professional collaborations, and then profiles that you have that list your publications and other research activities. These are all part of your research identity. So do you need to manage this? Well, if you want to publish and you want to track your citations, if you're applying for grant funding, especially federal grants, if you want to make sure that your scholarship is attributed to you, and again, not someone of a similar name, even if you change your institutional, institutional affiliation, if you want to make your research visible to other scholars, to readers, people who might cite your work, who might want to collaborate with you, who might want to fund your work. <clears throat> and then if you're on the tenure track, you probably want to be managing your research identity. So the profiles and systems we're going to be talking about, um, they offer different things. And 
it really can vary between different systems. But generally, they often have information about your publications, such as citations, links to publications, or they might provide full text versions of your publications. Some of them offer citation tracking and usage metrics of your work. Um, some of them offer unique ID numbers that can help distinguish you from other researchers. And they can also offer information about your research interests that might be helpful in locating collaborators. So a little bit of levity to start. There are a lot of different systems out there for doing this. And, uh, you know, somebody says we need one universal standard that covers everyone's use case, but that's really hard to do because people have different needs in this area. So we're going to look at some of these different systems and how they might work or not work for you and the needs of your research. So the ones we're going to focus on today our NC Docs, which is based here at UNCG, ORCID, Google Scholar, and Scopus from Elsevier. There are many other systems out there. Just a couple of them are on this slide. You may use some of these. You may know of others. So Web of Science Researcher ID from Clarivate Analytics, um, Mendeley, another Elsevier product, and The Loop from the Open Science Research Network are a couple of other systems that do uh, some of these things as well. We will not focus on these today, but maybe one day I will have a longer presentation that covers more of these. So for those of you who are uh, here today, if you have a profile in one or more of these systems, I would love to know. Um, and if you don't, that's fine too. I just am I'm curious, so if, uh, in the chat, if you wanna enter any of these that you have a profile in, or any that you're interested in. Oh, great. Okay, yes, Sam has several of these. Thank you. So we will uh, we'll talk about NC Docs, ORCID, Google Scholar, and Scopus. And um, yeah, so let's get into it. So. And Karen um, says she has one in Google Scholar and she's interested in ORCID. Oh, good. Okay, great. Thank you. So first, NC Docs. So this is based here at UNCG and it's a repository of open access UNCG scholarship. And it's a stable long-term platform and a profile that shares your research and scholarship with the world. It also shows usage such as download counts of your work, and it can, can fulfill some of those public access requirements that some granting and funding agencies have. So a lot of um, like the NSF, the NIH, a lot of these publicly funded uh, granting institutions are really pushing for public access to publicly funded research. And NC Docs is one way to provide that public access. This is what the main page looks like. It is not the fanciest thing, but most of our traffic actually comes through Google. So most people who are finding profiles and research are not actually coming to this site, but it's pretty easy to use. Browsing options there on the left. Both We've got works from both faculty and students in here. And UNCG is the lead institution on this. It's a multi-institutional repository, however. So you can see some of our partners along that tan bar at the top. So here's an example of a profile from one of our professors in human development and family studies. And so she has a little bit of contact information about her, um, a brief bio and her research interests. And if we scroll down, if we were on the actual page, we would see 84 of her publications with links to open access versions of those publications. And we also see view counts of those publications. So she's got one that when I took this screenshot, was at almost 11,000 views. So <clears throat> this is one way that you can share some publications. We can't necessarily add everything, um, but it's a good way to share open access uh, work. So who can contribute? NC Docs can share scholarship from UNCG faculty, students, and staff, but not all scholarship is right for this system. 
So the works need to be the intellectual property of a faculty member, student, or staff member from UNCG. And collaborations with people outside UNCG are fine. We can add those. We just need for there to be at least one UNCG person involved. The works should be complete and in their final form. Um, so that means we don't want to be adding lots of different versions or drafts. We want it to be the most complete, most final version of that work that we can get. And they should be scholarly research or educational materials. The main uh, or the bulk of the materials that are in NC Docs are journal articles. Uh, we can also add many other types of things. So some people like to add slides generally as PDFs from conference presentations. Some people who are creating different kinds of scholarship add multimedia, and we can add lots of other things. One of the main challenges we run into with adding multimedia materials that might include audio or video is copyright. So we have to be able to get copyright clearance to add everything to the database. Um, so why would you use this? If you want to easily share full text versions of your scholarship, and increase your readership because your scholarship is more openly available, if you want an openly accessible scholarly profile, and if you want to support open access, this is a good system, um, and we try to make it very easy to use. So how do you get a profile? You can email us, ncdocs at uncg.edu. You can send us documents directly, such as copies of articles, copies of presentation slides, or you can send a CV or a list of your publications, and we will take care of checking copyright on your publications, checking uh, journal permissions, and we'll, we will add the publications for which we can get copyright clearance. And then we'll let you know what the outcome is. And you can also share whatever information you would like to go on your profile, any contact information, a bio statement, we, uh, you send it to us and we get it up online. So that's NC Docs. The next one is ORCID. So ORCID stands for Open Researcher and Contributor Identifier. But really, we just call it ORCID. Or you might hear it referred to as ORCID ID, ORCID number. Um, it is a persistent digital author identifier. So it provides, it's a number, and I'll show you an example in a moment. It provides authoritative identification of your creative and scholarly works with your ID number. It distinguishes you from other researchers, and it can support automatic linking of your works across different institutions, publishers, and funders. It does work with a number of different systems, including Crossref, Scopus, and others. Um, so it, it is, uh, it's used by a number of funding agencies, granting agencies, uh, journals. A lot of different groups have incorporated the use of ORCID IDs to be able to uh, identify their, their authors and scholars. So their goal is that you can enter your data once and reuse it often. And they make it very easy. Anyone can sign up to get an ORCID ID. You can register, it's very quick add whatever information that you would like. And we're not going to go through the whole process of the, an activity of getting these IDs today, but uh, I will say that the sign-up process is very easy, and it also offers you a lot of options in terms of privacy. So you can have an ORCID ID and not share your, your profile uh, publicly if you prefer, or you can share it uh, with certain people or publicly. Um, so this is an example of a screenshot of a UNCG faculty member who has an ORCID profile. And um, you see that number as part of that web link in the upper left. So this is kind of like a DOI or digital object identifier, but instead of for a publication, this is for a person. So when we go to that web link, we come to Nick Overly's ORCID page. And there's a lot more, uh, you can see these works, 50 of 197. So he has a lot of publications that are here and linked in ORCID. And one way that this is different from NC Docs is that, so we see these citations and we see the DOIs, but this is not an open access database. So it provides those citations, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you would be able to access those articles. 
So you can click those DOIs, all these links are clickable, but they will take you to different systems and we may or may not have access. So it's possible that you would hit a paywall. So this is really to bring together his works as citations in one place, but not to bring them together as an open access database. Um, so, and on the left, you can see he's added a website and he's also linked other researcher IDs to this profile. So you can see his scope as author ID number, he has a loop profile and a researcher ID number. So he is bringing those together and associating them with his ORCID ID. And I wanted to show a couple of examples of where you might see ORCIDs in uh, sort of in the wild. So this is a journal that I write a column for in the library world. And in the middle, you see that login via, and you see that little green circle with ID in the middle. So that's an ORCID ID sign-in link. So instead of signing in with a username and password, I could sign into this journal using my ORCID. And this journal, when they, uh, in their checklist of what to include for authors, they ask for ORCID IDs if possible. And when they publish pieces, you see down at the bottom, you've got a title, the author, and then again, you see that little ORCID symbol. If we clicked on that, we would go to this contributor's ORCID profile. So some journals really incorporate these into published works so that you can see other works from that author. Why would you use ORCID? So it allows you to disambiguate your name and research from others who might have similar names and research. It allows you to identify yourself and your scholarly output to publishers, funders, and other institutions. And some of those funders and publishers are actually requiring the use of ORCID IDs for authors. You can receive automatic updates when manuscripts are published or grants are awarded so that your profile in ORCID would be automatically updated. And so at this last one, I haven't actually seen this in action, but some grant publications that are linked to ORCIDs can actually be moved through, directly through ORCID, through their system to be deposited, I think in like PubMed and other repositories like that. So I haven't used this in practice, but this is something that they are set up to do with certain systems. How do you get one of these? They make it pretty easy. You go to orchid.org and register. And I've included a link with a little bit more information for researchers about why you might get one of these and how it works. So the next one we're gonna talk about is Google Scholar Citation. So this creates a profile that groups together all your publications that are indexed by Google. And it's important to note that indexed by Google piece because it's not going to be necessarily all of your publications. It's only going to be the ones that are in the world that Google has access to. Um, and it tracks citations and graphs them over time, and it computes some citation metrics about how your work is being used as well. So when you go to Google, Google Scholar, in the upper left, you see that little My Profile link, and you would just click on that. And here's an example of a UNCG researcher with a Google Scholar profile. So this is Paul Sylvia from Psychology. And so we see his name and his photo and his institutional affiliation. We don't see his email address. We, we do see that he has a verified email at UNCG. Um, it does not share your email address without your permission. Uh, you can probably set it up to share your email, but why would you want to? Um, and you can see there below his his photo and bio info, uh, we've got titles and brief citations of some of his work. And if we scrolled down, we would see a lot more. We also see columns for cited by, so those are the numbers of citations for each of those works and the year that they were published. And then in the upper right, we see some more citation information. So the number of citations, so he's got almost 18,000 citations of his publications that are indexed in Google Scholar. His H index, which is one citation metric, is 73. And this, this like blows me away. His, this is not, um, Paul is an outlier in, the ter in terms of the number of citations. The, I can't remember how the I-10 index, uh, what they are calculating, but the H index means that he has 73 publications that have each been cited at least 73 times. Um, 
my H index for comparison is like three. Um, so there's a wide variety of, uh, of citation metrics out there and you have to remember that these are only calculating part of the world of citations because it's only what's captured in Google. So we also see a graph with citations over time. Um, and again, this is not an open access database. So we see links that we could click on and we might be able to get to some of his articles through those links, but we also might hit paywalls. So this is not, um, it's not an open access database like NC Docs. It, uh, it's a commercial product. And while it's bringing together the citations, it is not necessarily going to give you access to those publications. Why would you set one of these up? If you're interested in tracking citations, this is a good one. It, again, is not going to be everything, but it's going to be a lot. Google does index a lot of things. It allows you access to some metrics of your scholarship, and you, it's a pretty easy to edit, although there is not, you can't add a ton of information to it aside from your citations. Um, but what you can do, it's easy to edit, and it can go with you no matter what institution you are at. How would you get a profile? You can register online, scholar.google.com, and it's recommended that when you initially set it up, you use your personal Gmail account, not your institutional email. You can then affiliate your institutional Gmail with uh, your Google Scholar account. But the reason for this, um, so if you sign up with an institutional account and then you move to a different institution and you no longer have access to that email, you may lose access to your Google Scholar account. You can set up another one and it is possible to migrate content between accounts. But if you have entered a lot of publications, this can be pretty time consuming. So it's not gonna be a huge deal. You wouldn't completely lose the opportunity to, opportunity to have a profile, but it can make your life a little bit easier if you sign up with your personal Gmail then associate your institutional email with it as well. So our next one is Scopus Author ID. So this is an identifier that's automatically assigned by Scopus, which is an Elsevier product, I will again add. And the profile is managed by Scopus. It shows citation counts and some, a few other visualizations and other metrics, and it's only available to authors that have papers that are published in journals indexed by Scopus. So not everyone can necessarily have one of these. Again, I'm using Paul as an example, and we see a little bit of information about him. We've got his author ID number, um, and we see a graph there of his publications and citations over time. We see a much lower citation number. This is at uh, 7,400 versus seven, over 17,000 in Google Scholar, but that's because these are different universes of content. We also see a different H index. It's 46 here. I think it was 70 something in Google Scholar. But again, this is looking at a different universe of publications and citations. So this isn't necessarily bad. This is just different content. And if we scroll down, we see his list of publications. He's got 154 documents that Scopus has access to. And again, we see citations and find full text. And Scopus from Elsevier is for sure not going to give you open access versions of these, um, well, maybe in a few cases, but generally, if you're not paying for it or your institution is not paying for it, they are not going to just provide you the full text. So you do see the find full text link, but you may hit a paywall in trying to access that content. Why would you use this? This gives you another opportunity to track citations and access metrics and visualizations of your scholarship. And it's actually created for you whether you want it or not. So you want to check your profile to see if it's correct um, if you have a Scopus profile. So consider that um, if you have published in a journal that's indexed by Scopus, you may want to look and see if you have been assigned an ID and see if it's correct. So how would you find out and potentially edit it? Here is a link. Um, and you can search using your name and your institutional affiliation or your ORCID number. And you want to check your profile for correctness and you can submit changes to Scopus. Do you need more than one of these systems? And how do you choose which ones to use? 
So at, with NC Docs, anybody at UNCG can have a profile. Anyone can have an ORCID ID. With Google Scholar, only authors who have publications that are, have already been indexed by Google can set up one of those accounts. And with Scopus, only authors who have publications that are in journals indexed by Scopus will have one of those IDs. NC Docs is created and managed by UNCG, but we take all of the direction from you. We do not post information about you without your permission. ORCID is created and managed entirely by you. Google Scholar is created and managed by you. Uh, Scopus is created by Scopus. Authors do have a few management and feedback options, um, but it's less than other systems. Can the account go with you to other institutions? NC Docs is just for UNCG folks. We are not going to delete your account automatically if you leave, but we don't add to it if you leave either. Uh, we can make updates to say, like in your profile, that uh, so-and-so is now no longer at UNCG and is ex at X institution, but we're not going to be adding publications. ORCID can be used no matter what institution you're at. Google Scholar can move from institution to institution. Again, your recommendation is to use your personal Gmail for that initial sign up. Um, and Scopus can follow you to other institutions, but it also uh, may create duplicate institution or duplicate profiles if it doesn't immediately associate you, you at your new institution with you at your old institution, but it is possible to request that they merge profiles. Metrics. NC Docs offers document view counts. ORCID does not do metrics. That's not one, what they are about. Google Scholar offers citation counts. It does H index and I10 index tracking. And Scopus offers citation counts and H index tracking. Other features, so NC Docs, ORCID, and Scopus all offer you a persistent ID number. Google Scholar is sort of profiling you um, based on your name and research. It doesn't assign a specific number to you. They all provide some level of user profile. They all provide a publication list. NC Docs is the only one that provides fully open access publications. All of them provide citation metrics except for ORCID. Um, NC Docs, I put not applicable with user privacy controls because we really, we're only going to post what you ask us to post. So that's your privacy control. Um, ORCID and Google Scholar offer privacy controls. Scopus does not. NC Docs does not integrate with other systems that are out there. Um, ORCID works with many systems. Scopus works with ORCID. Google Scholar uh, does not integrate with other systems. And then the business model. NC Docs and ORCID are both nonprofit. Google Scholar and Scopus are definitely not nonprofit. They are for profit institutions. So, how do you choose which ones to use? You want to think about which systems index work in your field. You may not have the option of setting up a scope or of having a Scopus ID because it may not index work in your field. If your funders or, or publishers have requirements, that may uh, give you an idea. Your colleagues and collaborators may use certain systems. If you're a graduate student, your advisor may have recommendations. And then if one system has metrics that make you look really good, it's probably a good idea to use that one. Other considerations. So if you're looking to support open access, NC Docs is a great choice. If you're going to be publishing in scholarly journals and pursuing public grant funding, ORCID is a great way to go. And if you're looking for citation metrics, both Google Scholar citations and Scopus Author ID can help you there. So now we're finishing up. And if any of you have decided that you now want a profile in any of these systems, I would be delighted to know about it. Um, Thanks, Anna. But um, I will say Karen had to go, but okay. she said she had a few questions, but she's going to follow up via email. Okay, great. I'll let you know. That sounds perfect. Um, so yeah, uh, well, thank you, Sam, for facilitating. And uh, hopefully, oh, it's right at right at twelve o'clock. Okay. Wow, great. your timing is amazing. Thank you. That is wow. uh, impressive.
So um, for anyone who's left, if you have any questions, now's the time to um, answer it. Uh, uh, sorry, to ask it in the uh, chat, or you can turn your mic on. Uh, the chat works fine. If you hit the chat button, hover at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little chat icon, that chat bubble icon. Here is the link to the upcoming webinars. Our next one for this series on research and applications is Tuesday, September 24th at 11 a.m. and is on Policy Map with our um, GIS and Data Visualization Librarian. And Policy Map is a database that provides demographic, economic, housing, health, education, and quality of life data for the United States from sources including the Census, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, USDA, Zillow, and more. So feel free to sign up for that. We also have other ones in the series coming up on journals, the good, the bad, and the ugly in October, and one on Scopus in November. So um, here on the online learning and innovation webinar, another series that we run uh, on instructional technology topics. Our next one is in September and is on Google and HyperDocs, uh, so stay tuned. And then we also have other ones in that series on web accessibility resources at UNCG, Canvas Analytics, and tips for lecture and web capture. So I think that's it. I don't see any questions in the chat. So I am going to X out of this. Is there any final things you would like to say, Anna? Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, if you have questions, feel free to follow up via email. And thanks again to Sam for setting up and facilitating the session. I hope everybody has a great day. Great. Great. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.